Well, I hope everybody had enough turkey. Yeah. It's Thursday, so I'm going to it. But um, I do have an announcement to make our illustrious leader. Over here. Oh, yeah. oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I should have identified that. Um, when he finally took a job. <laughs> last night, when most of us were sleeping, he had two assists, All right. two goals, oh, wow. yes. and he was the star of the team. He's the only one that showed up, but he was. And all my cracker jacks were <laughs> full. He did. So now he's going to the championship, right? Next week, Tuesday, I got tickets for everybody. <laughs> Front row. Hey, you can go down. It's at Arcadia. I've been there. And. Uh, just late at night. Yeah, it's just late. You know, a lot of parking. <laughs> well, let me pray. And then uh, Neil's going to continue on in our trusting God. Father, we just uh, thank you so much for um, all you have for us, each and every one of us. And Lord, we appreciate the challenges that you've given us in our country. And uh, we know that uh, you have a plan. We don't know what the plan is. But everybody in this room hopefully knows you. And we appreciate the adversity in our lives because that builds character. It brings us closer to you. And we thank you for that. And I just pray for Neil this morning as he, he comes and, uh, and gives us your word. And just open the hearts to everybody in this room. And we just think of those things, Lord. Here and amen. Thank you, sir. All right, we've got about 57 minutes. All the Omicron people are online. Two seconds, right? Yeah, you laugh. I'm going to get emails on this. Um, if you have not gotten a book yet uh, entitled Trusting God, uh, David has been so gracious to uh, offer those to you uh, guys because I know there's a lot of impoverished guys in this room, but uh, that's what it says in the email if you need a book. But don't worry if you don't have the book or you haven't started reading it. Uh, hopefully, our discussion, our time here uh, will help you kind of get a sense of what trusting God is all about, and uh, because that's what we're going to talk about, trusting God, and uh, Marsha is kind of sending out some of the chapter synopsis as well as some of the study questions about a week ahead of time. We're dragging and lagging behind. Uh, we'll try to have uh, some of those hard copies here from time to time, but there's no guarantee, so if you've got it on the computer, uh, follow along with that. That's really more for your personal time. I will draw some questions from there. So every week I'm putting together just a little synopsis of a uh, sheet that you can get as out of the door as you come in. And that's kind of will guide our discussion time. We're going to do some discussion around the tables. Uh, we're going to do some open group discussion. And I, I really want to tap into the wisdom that's in this room because I don't know if I've got any this morning. I've been soaking in this book now for about a month. I told you how this whole this all happened was that Jerry uh, showed me this book, Trusting God, probably about six months ago and said, this is a great read. Well, Jerry's given me about 23 books to read, so I'm only on about 22 behind. So I kind of put it in the pile, but I brought it home and I said to my wife, this would be a great book for you to read, you know, and never say that to your spouse because she's like, yeah, she throws it on the on the nightstand and never touches it. A week later, she comes back with a, a book that somebody from her work gave her. She said, hey, there's this book, Trusting God. Somebody, and then she read it. Um, and then a week, literally a week after that, Dave Cavan brings a copy to Marketplace and said, hey, what do you think about this book, Trusting God? And so in God's providence, um, get it? A little segue how I did that there. Um, <laughs> I thought perhaps that would be something that we would discuss. And it's something we all battled, like moment by moment. Uh, we struggle to trust God every moment of every day. And I love the way that Jerry Bridges takes us deep into the word of God, his purpose to convince you that God is sovereign and that he is worthy, not that he has to earn it, but he is worth trusting in. And so I want to continue that conversation. We're going to kind of talk about chapter two today with the question, is, is, is God in control? But before I do that, I want to pray again uh, for Donnie. <clears throat> Donnie brought some copies in this morning, and they were the wrong kind. And so um, 
When you come in, there's a whole bunch of copies on the back table. Uh, that's Donnie. Donnie brought his new friend Damien with him this morning. And you imagine trying to juggle that coffee and donuts. And then he started a donut pandemic because my friend Pete brought donuts in here. His friend Danny didn't. And then um, <laughs> Dave also brought some donuts. So make sure you get all sugared up. Yeah, I told you I was going to do this to you, but because I think you can take it. Right? Yeah, okay. So, um, uh, and that's all I'll say about that. So, but uh, with Donnie, in all seriousness, uh, Donnie's been a part of uh, not rescuing, but uh, showing what it's like to be like Jesus. Marrying a gal that had a number of kids, and now he's got an instant family. And then just recently, he uh, uh, brought his little friend Damien, who's, who's, whose family is going through, through it. And uh, that's all I'm going to say about that. But I thought we could pray for him today, and uh, as he takes on so much for us, and uh, he's a great brother in Christ. So I uh, want to pray for his family. Lots going on in, in that young boy's family, and I mean, I, I don't need to say much more. But let's pray for Donnie. For a minute, and then we'll dive into Romans chapter eight. If you get it Bible, you can cheat and get there again while I pray. Father, thank you for uh, again just for these guys that have come out week in and week out. God, I, I you know my biggest fear, and even it's a fleshly one. I don't want to waste anybody's time. So, Lord, I don't think you waste any moment. So, there's a, a reason based on your sovereignty and your control and your providence that we're here this morning. So, I pray that we would walk away with um, perhaps some fresh thinking about who you are. And how we follow you, instead of trying to control you, instead of trying to um, make, shape you know shape you into what we need you to be. So it would help us with that. But I pray for our brother Donnie this morning. God, I thank you for this man that is selfless, kind, literally a rescuer uh, in so many ways. And Lord, a hardworking man. And in recent months, Lord, we know that he has gone through so much. And you never guarantee that you'll take heartache and challenge away, but you do promise you'll be with us through it. So, Lord, I know you're not wasting any moments there, but we pray for this young man, Damien, and the days that follow, Lord, that you would protect his tender heart and his sweet soul, because you said children are so precious to you. So, bless that family and encourage their Donnie's heart as he leads them, and uh, work your purpose through it, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. If you look at Romans, the, the, the first question that uh, Jerry Bridges puts out there is, is can God be trusted? And, uh, and that's a tough question. I, I sort of read through that several times, and it's really challenging. We all say, if you're religious at all, oh, I trust God, right? Until adversity comes in your life, until trials come into your life. And, and then many, many people will raise an angry fist at God and say, I'm done with you. Why? Because we want, as I prayed just a moment ago, we want to fashion God into somebody that is like a genie in a bottle, somebody that we can say, um, do what we want you to do. And when life doesn't turn out the way that we prescribe that it should, that's when we have a little conversation with God. So we all trust God as long as my bank account's full, as long as my health is great, supply chain's working, uh, my president is in office, whatever it might be, um, we all have no trouble trusting God. But one of the things that the most provocative things I think Jesus, one of the most provocative things Jesus himself said was that passage in John 16, 33. In this world, what is it? How does it go, right? You will have trouble. And so if people who raise an angry fist at God have never read the Bible. But Jesus qualifies that phrase by saying, but take heart, I will overcome the world. And what's he saying when he's here? He's, he's inviting us to follow him. And this book is a is an historical book, a historically accurate book. If you ever get a chance to go over to Phoenix Seminary, there's a couple guys, Peter Drury and uh, Gurry and uh, who's the name? John Mead. They do a thing called the uh, Canon Institute. I think it's called. Has anybody ever gone to that? And it just is, is a is a class uh, on how we got our Bible. How do we got these sixty six books? And because we're in a day and age where we're really a post Christian and post biblically literate culture we live in because we live by sound bites instagram snapchat that's how we get our even our religion that way or we go to church and it's more about is the music good that i feel good by the message rather than understanding the word of god when you understand how this book came together that was one of the things that solidified my faith it is powerful and so from genesis to revelation you have the message that there is a problem on earth there's a problem and that is that it's a fallen earth. Happened in the gar garden, you all know that. Many of you understand that. And now we're meant to suffer in this world. It's a temporary world. We're told, we see in, right away in Cain, God tells Cain, don't dwell in any cities. 
Cain, first thing he does is build a city. And God was trying to remind Cain that this is not the place we settle. And we, fast forward thousands of years, we have the same problem. We have a sin problem in us that keeps us uh, out of fellowship with God, and that needs to be reconciled. And, and that also forces us to have a lens that we put everything through in this life. Does that make sense? It's so funny. My wife says, I hate when you say, does that make sense? Because it forces everybody to go, yes. And so I like that power. So um, we all got the sin issue in our life, and, and that lens causes us to skew what what's really happening. So we look at life and we think, well, if God is good, why do bad things happen? And that's, uh, you know, Jerry Bridges goes in, in the second chapter on trusting God, talks about that book by Rabbi Kushner, why do good things happen or bad things happen to good people? And so it's a fascinating book. How many of you read that? Remember that was like in the 70s or 80s? Still have it on my shelf. I thought it was, I think that's a really good book, but it's flawed. His theology is actually flawed in that book. Because if you remember, Rabbi Kushner says, is God all powerful? And you'd say, well, yes. Is God all good? you say, well, yes. But how can he be all powerful if there's bad things that happen? So God's, he, he reasoned that either God's all powerful and not all good, or he's all good but doesn't have the power to keep evil from happening. And we, for generations or decades, have said, well, that sounds good. The only problem is the Bible teaches us that God is all powerful and he is all good. And so as you learn to abide in him, you're going to start to see that lens or the, the fog or the, 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 the steam on the mirror. So it starts to clear up. As you spend time with God, you start to see more clearly what he's attempting to do. And that is, he's inviting us to see what it means that this world's going to give you trouble, but he has overcome that world. I, I put down the passage that uh, was in the back of the book where uh, Jerry Bridges encouraged you. I don't know if some of you got there and said, we well, can memorize Romans 8. 18 should actually be to 39. I only put the 25 and I wrote 35 up there. But I thought this is a great passage for us just to think about uh, when it comes to trusting God and how trust is developed through that school of adversity and trials. Um, so, Jerry, you've memorized this, so no, you haven't done it, but you're working on it. Um, Paul says in Romans 8 18, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory. That is to be revealed to us. Again, so Paul's take, picking up where Jesus left off. And he's saying there's something, there's a, and as Larry Crabb would say, we're living in a smaller story. And what we're living, we're very myopic. We're nearsighted. It's all we see. But there's a larger story going on that Scripture and the Spirit in Christ are trying to reveal to us. Always. He says in verse 19, for the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. So even creation subjected to sin and fallenness. Um, and so Paul ratified we're talking about that here. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. And not only this, but we ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. For in hope we have been saved, but hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for it? He already sees. But if we hope for what we do not see, with perseverance we wait eagerly for it. And if you were to read, again, verses 26 all the way down to the end of the chapter, you'll see God's purpose uh, in all of that. In fact, that's, you know, we didn't get down to it, but that's where Romans 8, 28 says, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. How do you reconcile that verse in all men? And how do you can say that all things work together for the good and bad things are still happening? Does anybody just have any thoughts on that? So this is our discussion time, Dean. Although we might consider not being good, we, we just can't see that it is. Because God's, God's in control of it, and he uses all those circumstances to bring about things in our lives, but not all to us that appear to be good until we get to the other side. Yeah, so we just don't, what you're saying is we don't, we don't see it. We don't see it. Right yeah, God's doing something. Any thoughts on that, Tim? So my thinking is that the, the challenge comes out of the fact that <laughs> God is all good, God is all powerful, but we are fallen, and we have free will. 
So we screw things up. Yeah. So that's that's the yin and the yang of it. I mean, he, he can make us all automatons mm -hmm. and everything would be perfect. He doesn't. We have free will. Yeah. He tells us what to do. We screw up. He can, he he can fix it. He could fix it. He can make it not happen. Right. But he gives us free will. Yeah. Well, he's got free will too. What's that, Roger? So God has free will too. <laughs> yeah, he does. Well, he's got all free will too. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. He corrects your free will. But, <laughs> my, Russ? my thought was Jim Elliott. Uh, you know, he, he went down there for God's purpose uh, to uh, save the Indians or whatever and, and uh, was killed. And it seemed like a tragedy, but, uh, and it was for him, but, you know, he, the, the tribes came to Christ yeah. as a result of that. Yeah, so we don't so see what's happening right now in front of the screen. So Jim Elliott, if you don't remember, was a, was a great missionary went down to the Aka. Indians in uh, Quito, Ecuador, mm -hmm. lands on a sandbar, opens up the plane, basically, and is thrust through with a spear. And you wonder, how, is God good in all of that? Yeah. So, this is your job, Bill. I want to be a <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So, yeah. Bill is waiting. <laughs> what do you do when I'm not here? I don't know. It's not right. This battery's on. You're trying to sound good for down. Sorry, Phil, go ahead. The rest of 828 is where people always spend. Right. That's right. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. All things work together for good. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. To those who are called for his purposes. But we're always thinking about our purposes here. Yeah, so I mean, isn't the key the second part of that verse? Well, the key is the second part of that verse, but it's also looking at the original language. The word good isn't about necessarily referring to our good. It's God's good. And God's good is definitely better than my good. And you're the Dallas guy, so you can correct me if I'm not wrong. But that idea of Romans 8, 28 is that God is working everything out for the good purpose that he intended. And so the reality of trusting God and the sovereignty of God and the providence of God is that I got two friends. Is that God is working out a plan and he will accomplish his purposes in this world? Our job is to settle in with that. That's why a theme all through the Bible is all of Hebrews, is all about rest. That's why David said, Be still and know that I am God. That's why John 15 says, Abide, 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 remain in me. That's why Ephesians 6 says, After you've taken up the full armor of God, to stand there. Why? Because God is fighting for you. And what happens is we get in the way of God. We put God on the timeline, right? We say, well, God, here's what I need for you to do. And there's nothing wrong with praying that. But when he doesn't do what we ask him to do, then we jump in for God. And we take over and we get into control. So, yes, God is working everything out to his, for his good. Jerry? You know, see, I did that. I just saw you like right out of the curtain. It just happened. That's why you're good, Pat. Yep. <laughs> uh, God, verse 29 says, God knew what he was doing. Very good decided from the outset to shape the lives of those who love it along the same lines of the life of the sun. This is on the message. The sun stands first in the line of humanity. We see the rich one in the shape of our lives. So even in the process of all these things that go down, breakdowns, uh, the loved one you prayed for you got sick or died, God's using those things to form us in Christ. Right. Things where we can probably get fixed in the redundant. He's working on that. Right, and we're going to get down to what Jerry's talking about here in a minute. What we talked about two weeks ago, remember we talked about what are the right questions to ask? So often we get stuck in a bind in our lives where we say, God, why? God, fix this. And, and what we'll understand when it comes to trusting God is that we're just asking the wrong questions and all that. I, I do want to share a truth. And then I want to go to a question just for you guys to talk around your tables. And the reason I want you to do that is not just to get to know each other, but there's something rich when you share stories with one another. When you can hear that someone else has gone through something, you might identify with it, or it might help you grapple or get handles on the truth that is so challenging to handle uh, in this life. And so uh, chapter two, again, is that God, God can be trusted, but is God in control? That's the big question that uh, Jerry Bridges wrestles with and, he, and the truth is this God is in control and I think it's on your outline he has a purpose and a plan and 
he has the power to carry out that plan. And so, you know, again, like uh, Rabbi Kush in the world observes pain and suffering and asks the question, how can God be powerful and good if there's so much suffering in the world? So here's what I want you to do just around your tables for just a, a few minutes. Think about a time in your own life where you uh, had a sense of what God's will was or God's will sort of clashed with your, your desire. You see what I'm saying? Is there ever a time in your life where you thought, here's what I think God's leading me to do. Here's what I'd like to do. But something else happened. And, and just take some time to talk about that around your table. God's plan didn't, work. God's plan didn't seem to line up with yours. Is that clear? Does that make sense? Okay. So, yeah, you'll say yes. So take, take three to five minutes. Just talk about it. Tell a story. Think about it right now. Is there a time in your life where something didn't line up? You had a dream, a vision. And it just didn't happen uh, according to God's plan. And, and just share some stories with each other and see if we can not generate some uh, encouragement and some lessons. So go. Good morning. I think Dave or Doug put us on mute so that we could talk as a group. So if everybody takes their mute off, we can talk and it won't go into the room. Here we go. I figured it out. Thank you, Doug, for doing that. Okay. So is it Val. I can hear you, Raymond. Okay. Val. Good morning, Ray. Good morning. Good morning. Morning. Okay, now that we can talk, we're a silent bunch. Well, does anybody have a story they want to tell us? Well, can we read? Recap the uh, what the question was again, just so I, I was playing here. So my apologies, but um, it's just something in your life that you planned, and God didn't quite follow through on His end, and it didn't happen for you. A disappointment, kind of a thing. So I can. This is a great opportunity for me to share with you guys just one thing, and that is uh, my dream in 2010 was to hook up a series of video conferencing systems throughout the nation and have clients call in and do what we're doing right now. And, uh, and in 2015, a little company called Zoom raised $50 million in San Francisco and uh, took away the business that I had planned on being me my company, my people, that kind of, I had 30 employees at the time and I had to shut the office down and because Zoom gave it away for free, I found that hard to beat. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so that was uh, about seven years ago. So it's been, it's been tough, but that got through that. But that was a big one with me because I just thought that it's a good solution and, and, and it had a lot of uh, godly uh streams to it because allowed all of the um, churches and so forth to to do what they do now with video and that was part of the plan so it just didn't work out uh, for whatever reason so that's it <laughs> that's amazing it is yeah. I mean that was foreknowledge almost you could say and then just say you know, how did that disappear what was that? I'm sorry. It's like you had foreknowledge ahead of time what was going to be, yeah. um, you know, in need, and no one knew, you know, this uh, this part of the story, you know, what was going to take place. Well, one thing for sure, I had a lot of. Uh, I, at, at one time, I had three pastors working for me, and we had all believers in the company, and so we had a great little company in Scottsdale, Arizona, and. And for some reason, it just didn't work out. And, you know, you could look back. And uh, I think I learned the lesson that I learned is don't look back. It, it doesn't yeah. do any good. And so we just prayed about it and found everybody jobs. And we went forward. And uh, it, it just was just a tough time. It, because not only for me, think about the other 29 people in the company, yeah. mm -hmm. all of a sudden without a job. So it's just a tough one. Just think of a scripture where it's like forgetting what is past and, you know, living in this present and he's got the future. It's those challenges that we have to apply to ourselves, you know, in those moment by moment um, challenges. Yeah. Amen. 
<laughs> jump on there. And it can be yeah. with your kids and anything else you want. It, but, yeah, uh, uh, you know, that was a, a big, big deal for me. But let's hear from somebody else. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Tired of talking about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a good, good one, Al. I think, you know, throughout my career at different times, I'm kind of going through it right now that kind of I, I fail to, to look at what the greater plan is and get too focused on Mm -hmm. what I'm doing and and maybe get disappointed that things aren't going the way I plan them or think they should go or want to go. And I have to keep looking back in the past to see how things came together and, and there is a plan. I know when I was the, and I think the thing I have to draw upon is those examples when you look back of seeing how things are part of a bigger, bigger picture. Um, I had been the, the uh, CFO at Colorado Christian University uh, 20 some years ago in Colorado. And uh, I had hired uh, the controller from Denver Seminary. I basically stole him. He had applied for my job and <laughs> didn't get there. And when I needed a controller, the president said, hey, you might want to look at this guy. And uh, we, we had a really good working relationship and friendship. And when I eventually became the chief budget officer of the Oregon University system, he was under a lot of pressure um, at CCU and was being forced out. And I created a position and brought him up to Oregon. And what I didn't realize was his wife was from a town 10 miles away from Corvallis. And uh, about a year and a half later, and I also didn't realize how serious his melanoma had been earlier in life. A year and a half later, it became terminal. And so that whole move, um, while I was frustrated in, in how my job was going, I really think God put me in that position to move um, Roger up there so that his wife and kids were close to her family when they went through all of that and his passing and the blessing that he brought his local church in Oregon was unbelievable during that time. And so, I mean, that's, I, I oftentimes that gets blocked out of my mind when I'm looking at, okay, what's happening today. And so, I mean, it is a little bit of a flip of the question, but kind of the opposite end of the, the spectrum of what, what Al's talking about. Um, so, you know, I think that gets back to what Neil was saying with, um, you know, how do we, you know, how do we have that perspective? Reading two books right now at the same time is that when God feels, you know, far away with that Jamie put out and also this one. And it's interesting how both of them have brought Esther's story in that there is a process of, uh, Yes, you know, moving forward, stopping, stall, you know, just God room. And uh, I've been fascinated with seeing, you know, both of those things being brought together and um, about his timing, but also given that space. And that's really where trust is exercised. And uh, I keep saying, kept circling it, uh, eagerly waiting. And then what we ended up uh, reading today a little bit from Romans is wait eagerly. It's like it keeps redundant, keeps coming back again, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Um, There is a patience, there is a uh, waiting, but there's an active like listening, meaning basically there is some participation. It's just not sitting there. Oh, I'm just waiting on the Lord. I remember hearing that as a kid. And it's like, you know, where does that get you? It's a challenge in today's world. Um, to press on and also to be still and know. Does that make sense? Yep. <clears throat> Are we not supposed to ask that question anymore according to uh, Neil's wife? No, it, yeah. it, does, it, does, <laughs> it does. It does. It does make sense. That was good. <laughs> hey, I'm, I'm, I'm not doing too bad for, for 6.30 in the morning. <laughs> That's good. Oh, early. I'm over on the West Coast now, so. Oh, okay. Wait, are you in LA or? Uh, no, I'm at Monterey. Um, oh, I'm the, the CFO at Cal State University Monterey. So oh. just started that this summer. 
for us as we try to figure out what's God up to, what's He doing, and, and we sort of bounce around. But uh, let's uh, let's dial back in to uh, this whole concept of trusting God. I think we all have a story. Uh, if you're like our table, as soon as uh, somebody primed the pump, boom, it just was like a waterfall. He was, oh, yeah, there were times that I thought God was doing something, and then he had other plans. And uh, I even said over here, I, I was, uh, I'll share a little bit more about this, but I remember dating girls. I, Karen hates when I do that now, but, uh, <laughs> but, but I remember dating girls, and, and every girl, like Karen actually, I, I think I've told this, she has a diary where she had 27 boyfriends. That's how girls are. You know, oh, I have a boyfriend for a day or a week or whatever. I'm number 28. I want to get a jersey that says 28 on it. I dated four girls my whole my whole career in dating. And every one of them, I still remember praying to God, God, I really want to marry Susan, or I want to marry Andrea, or I want to marry that. And I was like, wow. And Katie bleeds over and goes, thank God he didn't answer your prayer. <laughs> because I, at that point, I had no idea what was going on. I didn't want to be alone my whole life. And, and I didn't, I, you know, I wanted to be married. And it wasn't until I ran off to become a monk at Bible college, kind of true story. I was never, I was going to go to a monastery somewhere and just read the Bible forever and pray. And, uh, and that's when God said, okay, you can't do this alone. So he brought my wife into my life. And, and I was telling these guys, the best of the litter back in the, in the, in the rear view mirror doesn't even come close to what God in his smile had prepared for me in all of that. And so I'm, you know, I'm glad, Roger. Don't you think your mother prayed her into you? <laughs> no, because she liked Michelle. Yeah, I'm mom, pray mom is a big deal. So again, we all wrestle with what's happening in front of us and, and, and wondering what is God doing? That is the crux, I think, of our Christianity is right there. Do we really believe that God is worthy of our trust? Do we really believe that God's in control. I put on your outline just the world's conclusion. Again, that's the Rabbi Kushner says that God is either good and not all powerful. You can put some semblance down there if you're taking notes, or he's all powerful but not good. Kushner said you can't have it both ways. You just look at what was observable and says impossible. You know, maybe you've heard the term deist. There's a deist out there who believed that God put everything in motion, a loving, caring God, and then said, have at it. And then he's kind of stood off in the distance, and he's really uninvolved in the workings of our life. And it's easy to allow your faith to kind of stray into one of those paths. But keep coming back to the Word of God and God's conclusion that is, he is all-powerful. God is omnipotent. That's the big $10,000 theological word. He is sovereign. He is supreme, the theme of Colossians. And he is good. And the, the theological word that they tend to use and that Jerry Bridges again introduced, many of you know that is the word providence of God. And, and as I was reading those pages, I felt that same conviction on providence. It's funny how we are. When we think of providence, we tend to think that uh, it only refers to good things. You know, if it won the lottery, providence of God, right? I married Carrie. God was in his providence, knew that I would marry Carrie. And we tend to very, it's a slight nuance but we're just saying, wow, the providence of God. But very rarely do we say providence of God when something bad happens in our life. This is the providence of God that I got in that horrific car accident. No, we would probably say that, you know, that was a hand I was dealt or, or whatever it was. And there's a, a, a shift in our theological understanding or foundation. That's why this is so important that you understand that God is in control and that God is good. So if that's the truth we're working from, then the question begins to change. The question is, well, how is he good in the midst of those tough things? And so, um, again, yeah, Bridget says we're reluctant to, that's one of our problems. We're reluctant to say when bad things happen that it's the providence of God, but it is good. Uh, we all know that God sent the flood. He was upset with his people. Mm -hmm. he sent the flood. Well, will that happen again? Will, God, he, yeah. will he be upset with his people today and do something of that night? So he's asking, if God sent the flood. Well, we know he won't send a flood again, you know, because he gave the rainbow that we need to take back and uh, as the promise of that. But will God come again and, I guess, judge his people, right? In his providence, right? If God's in control, you know, and I'm, I'm going to get to that question, actually. I have it on our, on our outline. Here. I have it in my outline. I didn't want to put it in your outline so that I'd be distracted, but I'm going to come back to that. Um, here's a second problem we have. 
The one theological problem, we think providence has to do with all the good things God gives in our life. That's going to make you five degrees off. And as you grow in your Christian walk over time, that's going to affect in a large way your outlook on this life, your perspective of the smaller story versus the eternal story. Second problem we have is that we assume that God only intervenes in our lives at certain points. That's what Jerry Bridges was postulating. That God only kind of comes in once in a while. And because if good things are happening, God must be intervening. And when bad things happen, well, he must not be paying attention. I've, I've been guilty of that. Like God, and I, my biggest problem as an insecure person is I just think, do I matter to God? Like, I just drive in downtown L.A. once, and you'll feel like you're a little ant on a big anthill. You think, how could God know how many hairs are on my head right now? Right? How could God possibly know that? And so Satan... Kind of gets in there and makes you think God really doesn't care. God really isn't paying attention. And when good things happen, we just say, God's amazing. And when bad things happen, we think he's he's out of the picture. And as Jerry Bridges was saying, it's kind of a stop and go proposition that we have. But the truth is that God is intricately. Remember, the first truth is God is all powerful. He is in control. And he is up to good. He's a good God. Second truth is God is intricately involved. This is on the outline, right? In every aspect of our life, he keeps it all under control. Those are critical foundational truths for maybe you to circle back and say, okay, how do I reconcile that with my life? And then and then uh, Jerry Bridges defined providence as this. Providence is God's constant care for and his absolute rule over all his creation for his own glory and the good of his people. So he said his glory and our good are inextric uh, inextricably joined. And that's good news. The reality is that God does care about every little thing. And I'll tell you, every one of you have the bad theology of this. Yeah. Every one of us. Because we look at, uh, under God sustains there, you know, Jerry Bridges was saying that science kills our ability to conceptualize that God is the one behind it all. Right? We, just, we, we say, well, there's God, right? And then there's science. But God is over science. And what that does is it makes you take God. It's like you go to God and then you go away from God. God is something you could you open your Bible and you have a quiet time in the morning with a cup of coffee and you read a devotional guy. He said, okay, that was my time with God. Now the rest of my time is my time. The problem is God is intricately involved in every second. Okay, so imagine uh, just for a second breathing. No, do not interrupt me. <laughs> <laughs> breathe in, just breathe in. Breathe in and breathe out, right? God is controlling that. And we think, well, that's just an involuntary action and it's part of no, God is literally orchestrating the breathing in, the beating of your heart, the going to the bathroom in a few minutes. He's intimately involved in every aspect. I'm not trying to be funny that everything in our lives. God is in control. He's sustaining all of that. And this is a wild thing. And when we can think about those things, it really helps us grow closer to God if we think he's, he's part of all of that. Uh, I, I said what science observes, hypothesizes, then tests, it's actually God's providential act of sustaining all things. So science just, the best science can do is just observe something, you know, create a hypothesis, test that, and say that seems to happen all the time. But if God wants gravity to stop right now, he can do that. He can fun, but he can do that for a few minutes, right? Whatever God wanted to do, he can. And we see it. That's why we read our Bible, because we see God intervening constantly. I remember the, I, I remember the pastor, some of you guys do, where Israel was at war and God stopped time, right? The sun stood still. God can do that, right? And even when the sun begins to move again, God's doing all that. Think about, let your mind just meditate, marinate on that for a while. Every step you take, God is orchestrating all of that. How are you in the comments? Touche. Del Tackett, Truth Project. Yes. If you want to see God's hand in science and science in God's hands, it's a great series to look at. Del Tech is a true project. Yeah, it, it goes through seven different uh, realms of what man believes in terms of God's box. God's outside the box. And, and it just explodes. Yeah, there's so, and then thank you for that because I, I, I want to, when we're here, any resources that you guys know of that are helpful to that? Uh, is, is so good. We have a, a, a thing called Right Now Media. How many of you are familiar with Right Now Media? It's, it's, we have a license. It's not free, but our church has paid for a license for you. 
So if you were to go on our website and you just punched in right now media, it would take you to, I think you have to do an email to get a passcode or something from the whoever's, uh, but there is just a, just a plethora of resources on there. And a lot of it has to do with apologetics or, you know, uh, Providence of God, all that kind of stuff is right on. Del Tackett, the Truth Project, it is phenomenal uh, on all that. And again, we're just reading one book here. And just like good marketplace Bible study people, we want to take everything back to the word of God. So thanks, Howard, for that. Here's, here's another question in your outline. Uh, as we talk about God sustaining our breathing, God sustaining, I just want you to think about that. What specific evidence of God sustaining presence in the universe is most dramatic to you? So when you, when you, when you think about it, you know, the sun rises and the sun sets, so we know that the sun is the center of the star, and we, we are in a universe going around that, but you know, we see it like the rising and setting. So the planets, as they're spinning, uh, some of that stuff's fascinating. What do you guys just shout out? What are, of, of, of God's providence and sustaining all things in his creation, is there anything out there that's just amazing? You guys online that are watching on Zoom that just amazes you that you want to share with us? Good. I did something really stupid. Welcome to the club. We're all in there. Yeah. Yeah. We could go tomorrow and do something really stupid. I'm behind a friend of mine's house. It's up at the mountain. Tell me, mountain over here. Okay. I decided I need to climb up and get a picture of the top of Oh my. So I climbed up the rocks and I got up there, got my picture and started down. And I literally tripped on a rock, did a full somersault on all rocks. Oh my goodness. Came down and I made this arm as a hamburger. If I pull this up, it's all shoot up. Take your shirt off. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I got done. I, you know, I could have really, I could have hit my head. And yeah. I, I could have done, I could have broken these bones. Ooh. Like we have no idea how God is protecting us, right? I mean, Hebrews, Hebrews 11 talks about faith, and they'll talk about so many entertaining angels unaware. And you wonder how many how many times God protected you from something that you it could have been at a once one inch the other way or not. And and, it, and we might laugh about it. And even as I'm saying it, part of me goes, Oh, that's so silly. But the point is it's not. It's not silly. The fact that the, you know my flesh of the devil wants me to think, oh, that's just that's just foolishness. No, how many times you were driving a car and the fact that you you know left two minutes later you avoided an accident or you know what what happened? So God is God sustains everything. And just I just practiced this just meditating on that. It just it'll blow your mind because every little thing that's happening all around you, God is orchestrating, He is sustaining, He is in control of it, and He's profited. On that, anything else come to mind? I mean, like a sunset last night, where my wife and I were looking at the red sky, or it was yesterday morning, it was just brilliant. We're like, wow, God's creating that, and it's just an amazing thing for us to to think about. And again, I, I think meditating on that truth always allows us to come to greater intimacy because we keep God separate from our real life. That's when you're going to drift away from God. That's when God just becomes a religion. And what we're trying to do here is get you to see that God is involved in every moment of when you leave here. God's with you. Every moment when you snore at night, your wife's mad, that's providence of God and all of that, all those kinds of things. And that's going to allow you to be intimate and realize the truths of Matthew chapter 28 when Jesus said, I may not be here, but I'm going to always be with you in John 14. I'm going to be with you uh, in my spirit. Colossians 1, we looked at that this past year. Uh, great passage. And uh, Howard, you want to read that for us out loud? Colossians 1 15. Look at the, this one. It says about providence and the supremacy of God. He is the image of the invisible God, the first He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or, or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Yeah, that's probably one of the most prolific passages of scripture that just talk about who God is, what he is about, what he's doing. He is providential. He is holding all things together. What's his purpose? What is God's purpose in this life? Right? He's trying to reconcile all things, even the creation. And his reconciliation of us with him, right? 
That's called justification or salvation. God wants to bring you back into a right relationship with him. And as I was saying to somebody who didn't know Christ yesterday, what a joy it was to present the gospel to people. God's not a killjoy. He's not just up there going, oops, you got to say the right lines. And you got to look at the picture on the napkin at the coffee shop. And then you got to pray the sinner's prayer. I'm not trying to be goofy. I think those are great things. But I think over years we've made it a rule. Well, they, do, they, do they know exactly when they pray the sinner's prayer and what coffee shop they're at and what day it was? If you don't, you're not a follower of Christ. Well, I don't think that's good theology, in my view. Is it okay to pray? Yeah, absolutely. But to understand that God is bringing and orchestrating the events of your life to bring you to a place where you realize that this isn't all there is. Or as Jerry says, God is bringing us to the end of ourselves. That's what adversity does. Adversity leads us and helps us understand what trusting God is. But all the events of your life, God is just using that to draw you to the end of you. Where you cease to give up, you give up control and you say there's got to be something more. I think to a person in this room, most of the guys that I might know, you've all come to that place where there's some hardship in your life. And then God was able to bring you to a reconciling relationship through salvation. That's what you said, God, I will follow you. And so that's, a, again, God's purpose is to reconcile all those things. Uh, what does God sustain? We've talked about that. Food, time, breath, every moment of our lives. He's literally orchestrating. I was uh, preparing this uh, study the other day, and I put my back out. Have you ever do that? You, just, you, know, you know, how do you put your back out? It's never something dramatic, you know, like I fell off the roof or I was tumbling down Mummy Mountain with my back out. How cool was that? No, I think I turned to white uh, coming off the yeah. toilet, and I went, oh, my God. <laughs> I can say that here with you guys. <laughs> and, uh, and I couldn't walk. I couldn't get up. I'm like, oh, my goodness, this is horrible. What did you say? Yeah, you said it. Yeah, you said it. Yeah, you said it. Oh, Bill, Bill, I'm sorry, you texting Bill Heitzinger. <laughs> That's real love, right? Beneath the over. And you know, you laugh at all this stuff, but that, it does get to that point, right? It's that point where we're just so humble. But God is in it. I, I did. I sat there and I'm like, God, I'm talking about your sovereignty and providence and you're in control. I can't, and I literally said, I can't handle this. It's bad timing for this right now. Like, the hockey game I got to go to and all that. But, you know, I, what, what was, you know, as I sat there, I thought, was God not paying attention? All of a sudden, I got this, my back went out. Was God, did God not care? What was going on? And then I had to sit with that. And, and if you remember, two weeks ago, that was the wrong question. What was the right question? What should I have been asking? Do you remember? What should I have learned from that? Yeah. <laughs> you're, yeah you're not long for this life. <laughs> what are some other good questions? When you're going through adversity, what are some other good questions? What is God up to? Because if God is sovereign, he's all powerful, and he's all good, and he is in absolute control, the right question is, well, God must be doing something here. Rather than, why? Or God fix this. Or we all call people up, we get the prayer chain going. Not a bad thing. But we put in our heads, we're saying, well, if I get more people praying, if I have people lay hands on, maybe I can manipulate God. To, well, God's going to do what God's going to do. So there's another reason that we call the elders to lay hands on us. Maybe there's another reason that we call the prayer chain, right? God wants his people talking to him. Prayer draw, it unifies us. Maybe the bigger thing that God is doing is unifying us around praying for Donnie and the stuff he's going through. And God may or may not hear our prayers for that. It's up to God. But we don't get mad at God because we didn't manipulate him to do what we prayed for. That's not the purpose of it all. We trust that God is in it. We say, okay, God, whatever happens... Two things I have to do. I need to abide in you, and I need to persevere. That's all through the Bible. Rest in him, abide in him, and persevere. And the promise, I will always be with you. And as you go through life, you say, okay, God, what are you doing through this? Early Christians, you remember, sorry, remember this? And I can't remember if it was Augustine or somebody said that early, early Christians would literally pray prayers like this. God, do not release me from this trial until you have, I have soaked everything to your point, that you have for me and that you want to accomplish in this trial. So we trust God. We choose to trust God. Because what's the alternative? To not trust God and to trust you. How's that working for you, right? To trust God, Tim. So I have a question. You just mentioned that prayer is unifying us, which I, I think that's a good term. But then it, but the next thing that flows from that is, so if we're praying, like we mentioned with Donnie, does it 
help God to focus on the issue at hand. Do you hear what Tim is saying? So when we pray, does it help God to focus on the issue at hand? Does someone have an answer for that? Do you, you're pointing to Troy? No, I was, I, I was going to mention what you looked at Frank and I'm from Waukesha County, Wisconsin. Oh, yeah. We had a break recently. Right. Yeah. How are they viewing this? Because obviously, yeah. at Christmas, religious parade, somebody drives through and runs over the season. Right. right. Put that in the parking lot for a second. That's a great question. Come back to this. When Tim was saying, when we pray, does that help God focus on the issue, Russ? God, I, I contend God's already focused on the problem, but our prayers help us understand how God is using that situation. Yeah, focus is us. It's focus is us. Yeah, I don't think I don't think it necessarily manipulates, and I'm using that word, it's probably not the right word, manipulates God. Oh, he got to pay attention over here. He knows. But it is it does unify us. And but sometimes, you know, when James says you have not because you ask not, I think sometimes God is waiting, and I think um Richard Blackaby talked about that when he talked about prayer a few months ago. He said, you know, how to pray so that you bat a thousand, right? Pray according to God's will, right? Pray believing, and then pray trusting that God's going to bring into your life what he wants to bring to your life. Yes. Any other thoughts on that, though? And that, you know, Scripture says God knows what we need before we pray. So it doesn't help God focus. That God doesn't focus. It helps us focus on God. Yeah. So, and prayer is so, it's a conundrum because I've been to conferences, read many, many books on it. And every, then people think they're an expert on it, but no one really is. It, it, it's our way that we converse with God. It's, it's a way, and, and we don't fully understand, and we don't understand what we do. When we, we trust. When we pray, we, for me, I often hear this small, sweet voice yeah. in correction. Um, but I think prayer certainly is. He knows what's coming out of our lips. He knows what's on our mind before we think. But I think prayer is for us. Because when we verbalize it, we hear it. And that's the Spirit speaking through us because we pray. It's not in our own backwards. Such a good point. I think prayer helps us abide. Because I will say abide, abide, abide. I rarely ever tell you how to do that, right? <laughs> but we abide by. Prayer. Prayer allows us to come close to God. We go to church, not to check a box. It allows us to come close and create space to experience God corporately. Why do I read my Bible? Same thing. I, I'm learning to read this Bible. It's not a doctrinal book or a book of theology. That's in, the, in there. But it's a book that describes a living God so I can relate, abide better. So every time I read my Bible, I'm trying to understand theology, doctrine like the rest of us, and language and context, all of that. But I want to understand the character of the revealed God in the pages of the scripture so that I can abide better. That's the lens that I use scripture. Every I'm going through Deuteronomy, I'm slogging through Deuteronomy still. And I'm trying to think, God, when you tell people, you know, if you murder somebody's guy and you rape his wife, then you can take her to your wife. What are you talking about in there? And then I'd step back and I'd say, what is God doing? God didn't want any evil in the midst at all. And he made big points to, to, to go there. So, um, Let's move over to the question that Troy just asked. Troy's from Waukesha, Wisconsin. And uh, where is God? And if I'm asking the question right away, where, do you, where is God in that? Anybody want to take a stab at that? What is God up to in allowing a guy to plow through a prey? We all have the emotion. I even feel my own emotion as I, as I say it. We all have an emotional response, right? But again, we understand that God is all powerful. He's all good. You know, Jesus said, in this world, you're going to have trouble, so we can describe what is. And I don't even know, what do you think God's up to in that? Crickets. I don't think there's a right answer. Okay, not a right answer, Phil? We're not smart enough. To yeah. We're, we're not smart enough to figure it out? Phil, what were you going to say? He allows, he allows mankind to show us how evil we are. Yeah. Whether it's murder or murder. Yeah, I mean, he draws us back to him because we can't, I can't anyway say, how in the world can this happen? I can't answer that, but if I trust him, I think it's just allowing evil to show us how decadent we are and why we need a savior. So, yeah, so when you see those things happening again, it should help us double down on the truth. Okay, don't change your truth, change your viewpoint, and, and then stick with it, Roger. Well, I think Anne Graham Lott probably the best explanation. Say they get Lot? Anne Graham Lott, yeah. Oh, yeah. And she said, and quoted that the 
you ask God out of your life, out of your country, what do you, what, what do you expect out of it? Right. When you, when you ask God to get out of your country, get out of your school, the other thing, why are you surprised and we allow when bad things happen? That's the other thing. We allow it. Mm -hmm. This age group allowed it. Oh, wow. Rogers just opened up another can of arms. No, but we did. <laughs> we were all working. We were all blowing and going and how wonderful yeah. America was and how this, that, and the other. Yeah. And they slipped right into us. Yeah. It took hope. So there's a, this is the can of worms I didn't want to open right now. Because often we all, again, it comes back to if it's going to be, it's up to me. Well, in other words, we, we, we sort of think that I've got to do something. It's our fault. Is it really our fault? Maybe. I don't know. The answer to that question, what are you going to say? How many in this room relate to, or can you do a private ballot? No, how many of this room relate to the elephant or the donkey or the lamb? What party? Party. <laughs> That's good. I don't know the donkey or the lamb. I'm from Canada. No. Yeah, I think you know, like in scripture several times you get examples of people saying, "Well, why did this happen?" And Jesus would say, "So the glory of God could be shown." Yeah. You know, so it's like what happened in Waukesha, what happened in Charlottesville. It's, it's how do we as Christians react? God, Jesus left this world but said there's much to be done. Right. So do we retaliate or do we come? Alongside these people, lift them up and show them the glory of God. You know, in, you know in, when the when the white guy went into the black Bible study and shot nine or ten people, whatever it was, you know, and then they returned instead of condemning them, they said, "I forgive you." And so, you know, if, if that's our attitude, if that's I mean, that's the way Christ was. You yeah. so know, if we can do that, then the glory of God is shown. Right. So, like you don't you don't you don't agree with what happened, but you you're there to. Everybody up in yep. Here's what I would, would say in, in this whole discussion of Waukesha and Rogers can of worms, and you only practice for this. And that is, is I felt the emotion when you said that, and, and you know, that we let it happen. And I don't disagree with that. I think there's a there's an onus on all of us. I mean, God is gonna judge us, he judges his own people first when he comes. Um, but at the end of the day, I think getting to what Bill said. I think it's our response. When we say we allow it to happen, what we're saying is then we can fix it. And, and then how we fix it is we go about fixing it the world's way. We got to go and we got to write blogs and social media. We got to vote people in office and all those things have a place. They're just so far down the list of the first things to think about. They're so far down the list. The best thing we can do to affect change in the world in which we live is to abide in Christ. The problem is that's boring. It doesn't seem right. And Satan wants you to think, Man, that, does, that just doesn't compute. There's got to be an equation. If a whole bunch of us get together, we rally on the Capitol, we protest, something's going to happen. I'm like, maybe not. And when it doesn't happen, did we, did we not do it enough? Did we, did we not pray enough? It was, no, God's, God's purpose is to bring you to the end of yourself because he wants his presence to be the only thing in your life. The only the thing to realize that that's all you need. And it was the Sandy Hook shooting in the book that uh, Mary Beth Chapman wrote. She said, we got to the end of ourselves. She went through dark mental depression when their own child died. And she went to speak to the parents of that shooting. And she said, when we went through our, our horrific tragedy of our own, we realized we can do hard. We can do hard. And she said that God, she learned only the truth. God is enough. And sometimes it's, it's the only way through that. The very first thing I said at the beginning was that trust is built through the school of adversity. I don't understand what's happening in Waukesha other than it's a sinful, fallen world. I'm not trying to diminish the pain and heartache, but just like Bill was insinuating, I think God's using that to set something up. And we ought not to keep doing the same thing over and over again, you know, and expect different results. That's the definition of insanity. But maybe we need to get right with God. The best thing I can do is to get right with God and abide in him and then be God's ready vessel. So when he wants to do what he wants to do in America or in Waukesha or in Scottsdale, if I'm not ready, I'm just off your plane when it was uh, tilted windmills over here. I'm just playing on the beach. When God's got a work for me to do, and he can't use me if I'm not trusting him. And if you want to experience the riches of God, there's a uh, you might want to jot down Psalm 105. Jerry's been going at this verse with me, and I think Pete, he's done it with you too. Psalm 105, verse 17. That's a song about the nation of uh, Israel when Joseph went through what he went through. Joseph went through all this stuff that he went through, and 
And, and I love the way Psalm 105, verse 17 says this. It says that God sent a man ahead of them. I don't think when Joseph's being thrown into a pit that the nation of Israel or anybody is thinking, hey, we're sending Joseph ahead. Get in the pit. Hey, we're going to send you ahead and we're going to sell you to a bunch of slave traders. Hey, when he's been accused of rape, when he's forgotten in jail. I don't think people said, this is, our, this is what we're supposed to do. We're sending Joseph ahead. No. But God was taking what the devil wanted to use to, to, to just create havoc, and he wanted to use it to glorify himself. And what happened? Joseph became the second most powerful man that allowed the nation of Israel to come together. Yes, it was in Egypt. They'd be there for the next 400 years, but God was setting something up. And that's the same God that is working in you and me. I wanted the last word, but I'll give it to you. No, it's, it goes to hell. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, so evil's in the world. We think we can fix it, I get it, but it's been here for a long time. And if we look, if we look at what look what happened to Stephen. And he was holding the clothes while they were stoned for his fall. Right? Well, Saul then. But look what happens to him. Now he goes out and does everything he can spend his, his life trying to work against the very people he was involved in. And wrote a lot of the book we said it. Yep. And we still are. That is so hard. So let me ask you this as we close. Is God in control of the pandemic? I'm just asking rhetorically. You know, is, there a lot? is he in control of our government? Is he in control of the supply chain? Is he in control of the gas prices? Okay, not that one. <laughs> is he in control of our liberal, liberal education systems? Absolutely. Is he in control of the White House? Absolutely. Yes. So as you walk out of here, maybe just a little bit, you can tweak your thinking. Go back to the two truths but, and just say, okay, I'm going to assume that God is all powerful and that he's all good and that he's actually in control. And try to put through the grid the experiences of your life. Just say, I'm going to assume God's in control. I get that card center, I get that diagnosis, or I get that challenge in my life. And I'm not going to put you on the spot, Bob, but one day I want you to because I know you talked about, um, and I think it's okay to say just the health struggles you've had the last few years. You don't talk about it now, but I think you would agree that you saw God in that. And maybe, maybe, maybe next week we can get you to share a little bit about that if you don't mind. I'm prepping you ahead of time because, uh, and we can all relate to that. So trying to put what you got through this. God sustains, God governs, and what has God up to is kind of the right question. So good stuff. Let's read chapter three for next week. Or next week is uh, Richard Blackaby, right? David, next week. Uh, maybe. Watch your text. Watch your text. <laughs> All right, let me pray. God, thank you for these men. And Lord, I just pray that you take the valuable minutes we share together and use it. Um, sometimes I feel like we're all over the map chasing rabbits. But Lord, this is good stuff. And good thoughts about uh, who you are and, and who we are in light of who you are. Thank you that you, by your grace and your mercy, that you choose to love us. I thank you for the truth that you care intimately for each man in this room. Intimately, and through your word, you're trying to communicate, or your word communicates that over and over and over again. Help us to believe that. Or as in the words of the centurion who came to Jesus, help our unbelief. Lord, help us to come to that place. And if it's adversity, Lord, um, that needs helps us to understand trust. We want to have the courage to accept that. And Lord, when we have great things happening in our life, may we just praise you and thank you for these wonderful blessings. All of it that we put under the heading of you are providentially in control and that you're all powerful and you are, you are good. Thank you for your goodness and the sweetness. May we hold on to that hope as we leave and may that peace penetrate our hearts so that we have the strength to walk in the spheres of influences in which we're in. Bless us as we go now, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Okay, there's a million donuts back there. David's going to have to eat them all if you guys don't. <laughs>